and uh, presently he is uh, one of the best theoretician in india working on quantum optics atom optics quantum matter physics many body quantum many body physics and quantum controls and uh, today in this uh, yeah. lecture he is going to talk about the red dwarf atoms and his progress so i welcome professor rajnas now the stage is for you okay thank you anji for the uh, introduction and uh, kind words and also thank for the organizers especially umaka uh, for giving me the opportunity to present some work we did on red bug excitations uh, a couple of your photonic crystal wave okay? so this work was uh, funded by ukeri it's a uk india initiative and uh, <clears throat> so let me start with the uh, introduction to photonic crystals so the photonic crystals are nothing but uh, periodic dielectric structures uh, so this red and yellow means uh, the materials with the two different dielectric constants so the three figures what you see is in the first figure it is a 1d array of uh, dielectric structure with the two different dielectric constants so this is a 1d photonic crystals and the next one is a 2d photonic crystal and 3d photonic crystal okay so in my work i was using the properties associated to the one dimensional photonic crystal and one of the key property uh, which we are interested in is the photonic band gap so i'll just tell you what is a photonic band gap <clears throat> so because of this dielectric contrast uh, the spectrum you can see that uh, here there is a gallium arsenic the first plot here there is a gallium arsenic bulk which is a homogeneous medium so it's like one kind of material so you see that there is no gap but as soon as i have a, a dielectric contrast in the system which means i have two different materials with the different dielectric constants there is a band gap which is a photonic band gap that means uh, the frequencies which lies in the band gap cannot propagate through this dielectric material so the light with the frequencies lies in this photonic band gap cannot propagate through the material and this band gap is proportional to the dielectric con contrast so that means if two materials with a large difference in the dielectric constant you will create a large photonic band gap okay so that means this photonic band gap is highly controllable so you have to choose carefully the material and uh, since this frequencies with light falling on this band gap cannot propagate so they can act like a narrow band filter so it filter out all the frequencies in this band gap and um, as i will explain later <clears throat> and um, this band cap can be utilized to create a cavity for the modes with the frequency in this band cap okay and in fact you can localize photonic modes in the material okay that is a key one of the other key thing so the question is what happens to light with frequencies lies in the band cap so the way to see is like since they cannot propagate so they decay <coughs> sorry exponentially and this is nothing but the evanescence waves which you study in the optics class okay so in order to see that in a homogeneous medium the incident plane wave will pass through the medium with some reduced uh, velocity due to the refractive index but in the photonic crystal where you have a dielectric contrast or a periodic dielectric structure and if you are in the bands these modes will propagate through the medium but if you can see that in the lowest case the evanescent modes where it decays exponentially in the medium okay and we can also ask how can i how if it is possible to excite these localized modes inside the crystal okay and this can be done with a defect in the system defect means uh, you can how you can break the periodicity by making the size of one of the dielectric medium slightly larger in between the periodic crystal or you can bring an atom which is a defect <laughs> or ion or some quantum other quantum objects close to the photonic crystal and around this uh, defect there will be a localized mode you can see okay so this i was saying that uh, you can you can break the periodicity in a photonic crystal then this can induce a localized mode in the around this defect okay and the frequency of the defect state can be easily controlled which is eigen eigen frequency 
of the defect state. So this is a bound state in the original uh, atom like Hamiltonian, okay? And uh, uh, the state is maximally localized for the frequency at the center of the band cap. If you choose the frequency such that it lies at the center of the band cap, this will be maximally localized. I will tell you why these modes are useful because as I saw later, these modes can be used to exchange excitations between atoms actually, okay? So my work is motivated by the work from this group, basically the Derek Chang group and the, the group from Kimball. So they propose a completely new system to study or simulate quantum anybody uh, physics. And um, the picture you see is basically a photonic crystal in the sense that uh, one dielectric medium you will see, uh, which is cut out periodically. So that will give you a dielectric medium of air. So it's a periodic arrangement of air and the material, okay? So this is nothing but a dielectric, uh, sorry, a photonic crystal wave. And then what you do is you trap atoms near this medium. And these are the defects, these atoms act as the defects and induce localized modes. If you have excitations in the system and these excitations can propagate through the medium I mean, like one atom to the other, and thereby you can simulate exchange models like spin exchange or something like that. Okay, I will show you in a minute. <clears throat> so if somebody is interested in knowing the state of the art uh, architecture of this atom photonic crystal setup, you can look at this uh, kind of review article. Okay, And in this article, they basically have a photonic crystal and they put an uh, uh, teaser or atomic teaser array close to it. And they were at the moment, I mean, like in 2020, they were able to show like 17 atoms, a chain of single chain of 17 atoms can be 17, one seven atoms can be realized. And based on this setup and the previous work I was showing from the direct chain. So we studied what happens if such an excitations are already present in this medium and what kind of dynamics it's excellent. So that is what my talk is about, okay? So the setup, you can see there is a photonic crystal and this is an array of atoms. These atoms act like a defects. And if the atom is excited, you can see that there is a uh, localized uh, uh, photon is there, which is basically a bound state of atom photon excitation. And uh, this photonic excitation can be, I mean, this excitation can be hopped from one atomic site to the next atomic site and leading to nice, interesting dynamics to the atomic excitation. So how to see, just I try to see the microscopic Hamiltonian and I will come to the many body Hamiltonian. So this atom field Hamiltonian is well known. You have the atomic part here and then you have the photonic part here and then this part, the G, which provides the atom light cup. Okay, and which is indeed depends on the transition dipole moment and um, all other parameters, which is known actually. This is very standard in the quantum optics textbook. So, so we can look at the, the band structure of the photonic band structure of the photonic crystal. And as I said, that depending on the dielectric contrast, we can create a photonic band cap. And if I choose carefully uh, the atomic frequency. So omega b here, I am showing this lowest uh, edge of the band frequency, which is omega b. And if I choose at an atomic frequency, the transition frequency with a detuning delta b. <clears throat> and if you solve for this system, what you will see is like uh, there is a bound state exists exactly lying on the band cap. And uh, to see this, basically what happens is like, you can think of like this atom is inducing kind of delta potential and uh, finally creating a single bound state of a photon and atomic excitation. And if you calculate all this problem for the single excitation spectrum, and you see that the single bound state, which lies an effective detuning delta from the band edge, slightly more higher than the atomic transition frequency, okay? And these are the parameters of interest to us, okay? And um, you can control the amount of photonic contribution to the state and also the atomic excitation by controlling this parameter theta. And we will work in a regime where the photonic part is very small so that we can integrate out the photon part. 
and we can write down an effective Hamiltonian for the atomic excitations, I mean the two-level atoms. Okay. <clears throat> so if uh, so, the condition is for sufficiently large value of delta B plus small delta. This is a far D2 limit. We can adiabatically eliminate the photonic part. Okay. And uh, without showing the algebra, at the end of the day, if I consider an array of atoms and uh, integrating out or adiabatically eliminating this photonic part, at the end of the day, I will get a Hamiltonian, which only depends on the, which are only describe the dynamics of excitations in the two, in array of two level atoms. So now you can forget about the photonic crystal. Now I have an array of two level atoms described by this Hamiltonian, but not that, the exchange coupling is exponential in nature. The range of this exponential uh, exchange interaction can be controlled by this uh, detuning delta. And alpha is nothing but the curvature of this slowest band, okay? And also you can control the uh, strength of this exchange coupling, okay? I mean, J is not a relevant factor here. As far as the physics is concerned, I can just scale by J, okay? So now I have a system which is exponentially decaying couplings between the two level atoms. And now my question is, suppose I create a single excitation in the system. So how this single excitation propagate in the medium? So you can have imperfections in the systems like photon less rate. The photon loss, the photon can loss outside the wave gate. Okay, and also there is a spontaneous decay from the excited state. This you have to take into account in the, if you have to include the imperfections, but the recent studies show that this can be minimized with a very high level. And you can um, see or observe the coherent dynamics in the system for sufficiently long time. Okay. So this is not a problem. So let me ask this question. So I have one chain of uh, atoms and I have one excitation at the center. And this will now hope according to this exponentially decaying exchange couplings. And I just ask what happens, okay? So <clears throat> let's assume a very short range interaction at the first case. So the, we consider L by A is the lattice facing. And what we see is uh, the diffusion of the atomic excitation on the lattice. So you can see that uh, there is a time at A T and at a larger time it diffuses across the <coughs> lattice. And this is the probability distribution. PA is the probability of finding the excitation in the site I. And this is the typical probability distribution you have it for a continuous time quantum walk. Okay. And uh, if I increase the range of the interaction, now I increase the range of the interaction. So what do you see? This is again, the, the y-axis is the probability of finding the excitation at the site I. So what do you see is like increasing the range of interaction. I see some kind of cosy localization in the system. And then there is also a tailing behavior. So in the increasing the range of the, of, uh, the exchange coupling, you see that the tailing is enhanced. This is expected. And at the same time, there is a kind of localization behavior which is also enhanced, okay? And uh, we calculated the distribution, the, width, the, 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 the variance of the distribution. And we see that uh, the standard deviation, which goes like linear in time, which indicates that this is a ballistic diffusion. Okay, and the beta of L, which depends on the range of the in exchange interaction, you can see that uh, the beta increases with L. Uh, this indicates that the longer the range of the interaction, the faster the diffusion, okay? But there are qualitatively two behavior which I identified for single, excite, single excitation case. One is like uh, for small range, you have a typical quantum walk like of continuous quantum walk like of distribution. At longer range, you have something like a uh, cosy localization. So now the question is how to understand this. So in order to understand this, we calculated the single particle cosy particle spectrum. So you can imagine this thing, the initially localized excitation as a source of cosy particles. And these cosy particles, as soon as t greater than zero, these cosy particles propagate through the medium. And that causes the diffusion of this, uh, the excitation, okay? And if you look at the cosy particle spectrum, you can see that for small range of interaction, this cosy particle spectrum is typically like the cosine relation we get for particle in a periodic lattice. And as I increase the range of the interaction, the modes which is close to the Brillouin zone gets flatter and flatter, and that corresponds to the cosy localization. So the cosy localization you see here is due to the flatter modes uh, near the Brillouin zone. 
and this uh, tailing behavior, this long tail, which you see due to the modes close to the zero, which are say finite group velocity, and it becomes more sharper and sharper as you increase the range. So the tailing can be enhanced by long range interaction and also the cosy localization also can be enhanced by long range interaction. Okay. And uh, this is slightly different from the localization people usually discuss uh, from disorder systems and so on. Okay. So uh, the cosy part of the spectrum basically explains the kind of the, the, nat the nature of the physics we saw here. Uh, so just summarizing here for single excitation, so as a function of the range of the interaction, I have a continuous time quantum walk to cosy localization and detailing behavior. And we also look at the inverse participation ratio as a function of time. So if the participation ratio value is zero, that means um, the excitation is completely localized. Huh? That is what you have at a t equal to zero because at t equal to zero, I have a completely localized excitation. So at t equal to zero, I have the inverse participation ratio zero. And as time goes, um, you can see that there, there is a diffusion and that means uh, my inverse participation ratio will should increase. And indeed that is the case, what you see. Uh, but we saw two different time scales as a function of time. One is the t square and t. So the inverse participation ratio reveals much more interesting features compared to the standard deviation, which was mainly saying that the diffusion is ballistic. And here uh, there is a t square dependence, which uh, tells you that uh, at very initial stage, which is super ballistic, which actually expected because the initial excitation is highly localized like a delta, delta p. So, and then in the very immediate time, it expands super ballistic. Okay, so at large time, as of course, as previously I said, that uh, the deviation is ballistic. Uh, so uh, you can also see a different aspect to this, since um, so you start an initially localized excitation, and this eventually spread through the medium, <laughs> basically the lattice. So I said that this can be understood from the cosy particle picture, where the cosy particle propagates from the initial source, which is the excitation on both sides of the lattice. And we can see that uh, these cosy particles can correlate the different parts of the uh, uh, lattice and make them entangled. So now I will ask this question, suppose I divide the initial lattice into two sub lattices A and B, and I start the excitation initially in the B sub lattice, and under the diffusion, how they get correlated or how the entanglement entropy grows in the system. Since at equal to zero, <coughs> The excitation is highly localized. As you can imagine that there, there is no entanglement and uh, we use the entanglement entropy to characterize the system and at t equal to zero, the entanglement entropy should be zero, okay? So uh, before going that, I can see the Hilbert space of the system. So we can uh, uh, simplify the situation here drastically since I have a single excitation. So since I have divided these systems into both A and B, I can consider the Hilbert space of A and B as follows. So the zero A means there is no excitation in A, or IA means that there is excitation in the sub lattice A at the ith site. And similarly for the B subsystem. Okay. So if you think of, if you think carefully, this effectively makes the subsystems in a two-level system whether there is an excitation or not. If the so that represents the two levels of the subsystems. Actually. Okay. So now we calculate <laughs> the entanglement entropy by partially tracing over the uh, density operator, density matrix. And then you can see that at t equal to zero, the entanglement entropy is zero because initially the excitation is localized. And over time, the system diffuse into the system and entangling the subsystems A and B. And here we plotted for different uh, range of interaction and uh, <laughs> For small range of interaction, the entanglement dynamics slower as expected because the diffusion takes time to propagate through the medium as the interaction, the, the range of the interaction is increases, the entanglement between the subsystems become more faster. And you can see that uh, there is a bound to the entanglement entropy in this case for the single excitation. And it is bounded to one, this is expected because uh, each subsystem can be seen as an effective two level system. And in that case, uh, the entanglement entropy is bounded to one, okay? So even though you have thousands of sites or thousands of atoms, effectively this gives a kind of an effective two-level feature into the system and the entanglement entropy is bounded to. 
Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. So you can also uh, uh, initially start your excitation slightly far from this boundary. And you can look at the effect of the range of the interaction. So for instance, if there is a very short range interaction, you can imagine that there is a finite time it's required to cross this boundary. And this can uh, cause a delay in the growth of the entanglement entropy between the subsystems A and B, which is I shown. Okay, this is just to play around with the, the growth of entanglement around entropy in the system. Okay, now the system, the dynamics becomes more complex. If I start with two excitations in the system and uh, later I will say that these excitations can be Rydberg excitations. And as we have seen in the series of lectures since last two days that uh, the Rydberg excitations interact very strongly and indeed, this can lead to much more interesting scenarios. Okay, that's what I'm going to discuss now. So let me assume that there are two excitations, uh, which can be in the lower state excitation that they don't really have density, density interaction, but still only have this exchange potential. So what I see is like uh, for small uh, range of uh, exchange potential. So what I show here is I and J are the, uh, the location of the two excitations. And what I pro plot here is a, a probability of finding the excitation one in i side and the probability of finding the second excitation in j side. Something like that you can assume it, okay? <clears throat> so this peaks, which indicates that uh, one excitation is in minus 40 and the second excitation is in plus 40. So that means that small interaction, small range of exchange couplings, if you start the excitations in the nearest neighbor they just repel each other, or it is called the anti-bunging of excitations for this small. And this is expected because for small range, it is not easy for them to hop over the other excitations, okay? As now increase the excitation, they can break this anti-bunging, okay? But, uh, and uh, at very large interaction, exchange interaction, very large range of, long range of exchange interaction, I would, expect the cosy localization of each individual excitation as I have been showing uh, in the case of single excitation. But here with the two excitation, I have an intermediate scenario. This indicates that one of the excitation is propagating away from the second excitation, but the second excitation is staying at the, almost staying at the initial position, okay? So it is like a kind of anti bunching but one is almost staying at the, uh, the almost staying at the initial position. And at very long range interaction, uh, so we can see that the cosy localization of individual excitations, okay? And uh, this can be again explained using the uh, two particle, I mean, like uh, this, uh, the single particle spectrum and the cosy localization can be associated with the flat modes and this, um, uh, <coughs> these modes with finite group velocity corresponding to the tailing behavior or even this, uh, and the anti bending of the excitations, okay? Uh, so you can also ask, uh, suppose I start these two excitations in subsystem B, now how do they get correlated over time, okay? So now we have the Hilbert space, the Hilbert space is slightly expanded. So if I take the subsystem A, you have a state which is no excitation and you have an excitation in the ice site. And since you have two excitations in the system, so you can have a, I and J site with the two excitations in subsystem A, okay? And similarly, you can have a, uh, the Hilbert space for the B. And you can imagine now that since the Hilbert space expanded and there is a chance that the entropy will be much more enhanced, okay? And basically you can take the uh, uh, subsystem density matrix and look at the number of non-zero eigenvalues and see the growth of the entanglement metric, okay? So before I was showing that for the single excitation phase, there is an upper bound to the entanglement entropy because of the effective two level picture we have. And this effective, that is independent of the system size, but this effective two level picture broke down when you have two excitations because of the long, the position dependent exchange couplings makes the different uh, two particle states different from each other, okay? So that means uh, the maximum entanglement entropy also will also depend on the system size and so there is no upper bound to the uh, entanglement entropy. And you can see that here, larger the range of the interaction, the faster the growth of the entanglement entropy, and of course, uh, larger the value at a given instant of time. 
Okay. And uh, on the left, I was just started the excitation at the neighboring site in the subsystem B, but you can increase the separation between the two excitations and you can ask how this entanglement growth. And you can see that at t equal to zero, it is zero because both excitations uh, are in subsystem B. And here I consider, let's take the case where the two excitations are separated by 10 lattice And you follow the blue line and you see that the initial growth of the entanglement entropy is due to the excitations close to this boundary, which is hopping to the subsystem A. And then it converges to a finite value which corresponds to the one, okay, which we saw it in the case of single excitation case. And this saturation at this is, can be understood as follows because the second excitation will take a finite time to hop into the subsystem A. And once that happens, this will again start increase. Okay. But if you initially start with these two excitation closer and this uh, <laughs> saturation regime gets smaller and smaller and it will eventually increase into the higher values of the entanglement. Okay, so this way you can uh, you can control this entanglement in the system, um, and you can manipulate this as your will, depending on the initial uh, separation between the excitations. Okay, and the other interesting thing is you can look at the two point correlation since you have two excitations, and uh, so I just don't want to go detail into this, but I just want to see that uh, <coughs> this can be seen as the correlations and. Uh, the x-axis here, you see as the lattice sites, and here is the correlation which grow in the <coughs> system, which is defined here, which corresponds to the two excitations which propagate in there. And what you can see is like, there is a like conformation. So that means the information propagate with a finite velocity in the system, okay? So, and this is typical for a short range interacting systems where you see a finite bound state. Uh, there is a finite value to the information propagation or the excitation propagation, which doesn't change with time, okay? And uh, this can be extracted out of the uh, single particle spectrum for the single excitation K, and uh, that this white uh, line, basically the analytical results, which matches perfectly with the numerical results, okay? So as the, as the range of the interaction increases and this light con kind of behavior will break down, and this is expected for long range interacting systems, okay? And uh, this is uh, the, so previously I was talking about two excitations, which does not exhibit density, density interaction, but only the exchange Did interaction. You stop? Yeah. So uh, now let me consider two Rydberg excitations. So I don't go into the detail. Uh, so uh, over the last talks, you saw that uh, Rydberg excitations can interact very strongly. For instance, order of micrometers, you can have very large Mertz range of interactions, okay? So let's assume that uh, these interactions are now Rydberg excitations. So then you will have to put an additional term in the Hamiltonian, which is VIJ sigma EI and sigma EJ. And for the moment we consider that this interaction is of Van der Waals type, so which decays over distance as one over R power six, okay? And now um, before going to the dynamics, let me look at the spectrum, because if we can see that uh, if there is something happening to the spectrum, some drastic change in the spectrum, then we could expect completely drastic dynamics in the system, okay? So the green, the green, so this is the uh, single particle spectrum, and sorry, the x-axis is the momentum, and all the green, which is basically the single particle states, which is a scattering state, okay? And what I see is like, if I put an interaction, there is this small branch, which is a red line, which emerges out of the continuum of states, and these states are completely different from this green states because uh, the red states are bound state. So that means that their wave functions decays exponentially as a function of the relative distance between the excitations, okay? But the green states, which is the green points, which correspond to each scattering state, which is extended over the full lattice. Whereas the red state, which you can see, which is highly localized and R is the relative position between the two excitations, okay? So this indicates that we have a formation of bound states in the system when I, as soon as I plug in the uh, interaction between the system, okay? So now, like, so if I increase the interaction, so you can see that uh, 
I can completely isolate this uh, bound state band and make it very far away from the, uh, the continuum of scattering states. And here I increase the interaction from 0.2 to 0.5. This is not very strong interactions in the language of uh, uh, Rydberg atom. So it's very easily accessible in the system. So if I keep V equal to 0.5 and increase the range of the exchange coupling, then you can see that the bound state completely disappeared. So this indicates that there is a competition between exchange and the density density interactions as far as the bound states are concerned, okay? So you can see that this bound state is peaked around uh, R equal to one. So that means the bound state correspond to two excitations at the nearest neighbor, okay? So now, <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So I just want to pinpoint that this bound state, which I'm talking to about two excitations, which are bounded is identical to the bound state typically people saw in the case of a part model, uh, the bosons in optical lattices, Okay, and also uh, the magnon bound state in the, let's say, SSC, X, XXC models in spin systems, okay, where you can create this kind of similar bound state. So they are somehow similar to these uh, bound states. Uh, so let's just look at the dynamics. So let's take the, the, the first case where these uh, uh, bound states are partially detached from the continuum of scattering states. And then you can see in the dynamics that there is an anti bunching of excitations, which is expected if you have only scattering states. And at the same time, uh, the, what I'm plotting here is again, the probability distribution of two excitations. Um, so sorry, here there is an INJ, okay? So the, the horizontal diagonal, which shows there is a quantum walk of bound state. So in this dynamics, you have a superposition of both the anti bunching of the excitations, and also the bound state quantum walk, okay? So if I increase the interaction strongly, and if I start with the initial state two excitations at the nearest state, uh, nearest uh, neighbor states, and you can see that the initial state can be written as a superposition of only the states in this bound state band, okay? And as a result, you can see that uh, there is a complete quantum walk of uh, bound state without any contribution from the scattering states. Okay. And if I want to, if I then increase the long range nature of the exchange coupling, and you can see that the bound state is completely destroyed and the dynamics is purely described by the scattering state. And again, this anti bending kind of dynamics. Okay. So, in so just to summarize, uh, he just to summarize here, so the the strong red bug red bug interaction, even though we didn't really go to the strong interaction regime. So we can actually simulate bound state quantum walk where the two excitations you start in the nearest neighbor, which will stick together and form a bound state and will move around the lattice. Okay. And playing with the range of the exchange coupling and the interaction between the red bug excitations, you can simulate both the quantum walk of the bound state and the, uh, the scattering dynamics. Okay. <clears throat> so here also you can uh, look at the two point correlation functions and you can see also the similar kind of uh, uh, Lee Robinson bound in the correlation propagation, okay? So now I can ask, suppose if I increase the interaction, okay, so uh, I can introduce one uh, parameter with delta, which basically give the spread of the uh, topmost uh, state, because you can see that uh, the bound state are always emerges from the upper state of the spectrum. So I can just look at the, uh, the, um, the spread of the, uh, the states in the upper uh, branch of the uh, excitation spectrum. And if it is a bound state, it will be almost close to one. And if it is a scattering state, it will be spreaded over the entire lattice. Actually, if I plot this delta R in this color bar, I could identify three different regimes. Actually, this uh, is agree with the dynamics which I was showing. So in this R1 regime, there is a pure bound state band completely isolated from the scattering state. So you can clearly see also the pure bound state dynamic. And in the R2 regime, 
uh, there is a coexistence of both bound and uh, uh, I mean, like the, the the bound state is complete, not completely detached from the uh, scattering manifold. Okay, and in the arterial regime, which you expect, where L is very large, you have a completely scattering state. And with the dashed line indicates uh, analytical results we were able to obtain using some tricks and methods, which I don't discuss here, which agrees very well with the numerical methods. Okay. So now you can ask because uh, with the Rydberg excitations, you can increase the Rydberg Rydberg interactions uh, to some significantly large values uh, by either changing the principal corner number or bringing the atoms more closer and closer. So now I can ask what will happen if the Rydberg interaction is sufficiently large. And in that case, what you will see that uh, the first band which, is, which emerges out of the continuum of states is very far from the rest of the states. And in addition, there is a second band which emerged out, out of the scattering state. So the first one which emerged out has a bound state of this character, which is the type one bound state, we call it as, where the excitations are at the nearest neighbor side. And the one, the second band which emerges out corresponds to a type two bound state where there is a ground state. It is separated by two lattices, okay? so. The type one, which is the red one, which is basically uh, separated by one lattice sites, and the type two, which I call separated by two lattice sites. Okay. So now let's see what happens at these values of uh, parameters, how the dynamics will be. So it depends uh, actually on the initial state. So if I start with the initial state, uh, similar to one of the type two bound state, then you will see that there is a pure <coughs> quantum walk of this type two bound state actually, okay? And if I start with something like a type one initial state, then the dynamics is slightly different, okay? which I am not showing here, which can be much more complicated, but um, you will have the contribution from both type of bounds. Uh, you can also uh, control these parameters and induce a lot of different kind of dynamics, okay? And I just want to, convince you that uh, the dynamic critically depends on the overlap of the initial state with the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, basically the spectrum, this eigenstate which I show here. So that's what I was saying that if you start with the type two bound state, you will see a type two bound state quantum walk. And if you start with the type one bound state, you will see a type one. And similarly, you can control the initial state and eventually control the overlap with the eigenstate of the spectrum. And you can create different kinds of dynamics in the system, okay? And the dynamics exhibits uh, non-trivial depends on the interaction strengths for different initial states, okay? So the people may ask like, uh, suppose if I want to include the imperfections and uh, so one of, suppose I take a realistic case where I consider medium atom and fortify S half and typically the experiment J is equal to one megahertz. And if I calculate uh, the decay rate of fortify S half, the gamma by J, which is a spontaneous decay rate, which will be around 10 raised to minus two. So that means uh, the decay rate can be easily neglected, but still can be, uh, you can see what happens to the system. And uh, the, the photon decay outside the wave curve is completely, can be com completely suppressed over a long time. So you can really, you don't really have to take into account that here, okay? So what I wanted to show that <clears throat> for the single excitation dynamics, including the dissipation, we were able to capture the quantum walk dynamics, which we predicted for the single excitation, the coherent dynamics. And also we were able to see the cosy localization and also the uh, uh, tailing behavior, okay? So we were also looking at for the different, uh, even large decay rate that is equivalent to taking lower and lower uh, red box states. And uh, in fact, we were able to simulate um, uh, the two excitation dynamics also for a small systems uh, for 20 to 20, I think it's around uh, 40 to 40 or something. Okay, So we were able to calculate uh, the two excitation dynamics also including the imperfections which one would expect in the experiment. And we can see that it is much robust against the spontaneous decay and other decays in the system. Okay. So summarizing, uh, the atoms coupled to uh, photonic crystal wave grid is emerging as a new platform for studying quantum monomery dynamics and exploiting the models, which is proposed very recently by this group. And we look at uh, how these excitations 
propagate in the system. And for the single excitation, I was able to show that um, there is a continuous time quantum work to cause localization dynamics. In the two excitation case, we have anti-bending and also partial cosy localization and uh, rudberg rudberg interaction lead to bound pair quantum work. And the nature of the bound state can be controlled further by tuning the interaction between the rudberg states, okay? And this work was done by my previous PhD student, Ashwin Chaugile, and uh, my previous master's student is doing PhD in Oklahoma at Jugal and in collaboration with Thomas Ramos from Madrid, Spain, okay? And I thank you for all of your attention. Okay, if any questions, I can take it. Hello. Uh, uh, Professor Reggie is here. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, there is one question. It has yeah. been asked in the chat uh, box by Arnab Sarkar. He asking all entanglement entropy plots have oscillating behavior and periodicity is changing with interaction range, probably linear relationship. So it looks like there is a critical interaction range where the oscillation changes from over damped to under damped. Can you please comment on that? So one second, so, sorry, can you please repeat? Uh, where can I read the question? Uh, I say, uh, Arnav Sarkar, are you here? Okay, yeah, yeah. Ah, you asked directly. Yeah, so uh, I'm asking, so yeah, all the- This plot, the, right? Yes, yeah. and the next plot also. So- uh, So this, this one, right? Yeah, yeah, both. So the, the entanglement entropy has this oscillating behavior and this uh, oscillation period looks like uh, changing with the, the interaction range. Actually, we, we tried to explore this a uh, uh, little bit, uh, the nature of the oscillation and if we can associate, but unfortunately we failed to um, characterize using the interaction parameters, okay? Uh, okay. And, and which actually we were, uh, we were trying to extract this, but we couldn't find any uh, precise relation with, uh, because it's showing very completely uh, different behavior depends on the interaction parameter. So um, unfortunately, I couldn't, I cannot give a very correct, concrete answer for this because we were also exploring this, uh, the same question which you were asking. Actually, it's a good question, but unfortunately, we couldn't come up with a uh, convincing answer for this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sir. Yeah. So, um, uh, Rajesh. Yeah. Uh, you are showing some places in the plots. They just look like our when we are learning the quantum mechanics when we are increasing the n and it's more in the right side and it centers. Is there any connection with that uh, here you're showing? Uh, Whatever we were learning the basic quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, so is there any connection with that, these uh, graphs? No, actually this is just the excitation dynamics actually. So it's not like a, uh, the excited states or something. This is just one single wave function with propagate. Uh, so what, uh, when I saw first time, they just reminding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You think things. that it is, two different uh, excited states or something like that, right? Okay. Yeah, this, yeah. Okay, so now I think there is no more question. So thank you for giving such a interesting talk and your new results. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, and- uh, So I will start. Huh. Professor Bhanu? Yeah, Ajay. Yeah. Hmm. So any words from your side? No, so, so it's uh, wonderful. Well, yeah, just, uh, go I'm so sorry, please, please. No, no, no please, go, please go on. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I'd like to thank, uh, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Rajesh. I mean, thank you. My um, you know, very interesting results. And, uh, you know, hope, uh, you know, we can work together to take yeah, this, definitely. you know, yeah, to take the uh, quantum technology mission forward. Okay. Yeah, so our okay. next uh, session will start at uh, 3.30 now. And uh, the talk is by Lua Candrier from France, from Pascal. So I would like to request you all to join another interesting talk this afternoon at 3.30. Okay, then. Okay. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, bye bye. Thanks, Rajesh. Yeah. Bye.
थैंक यू माँ बाय बाय टेक केयर